and uh, I did some uh, theoretical nuclear physics research um, at a government funded laboratory, a national laboratory, and it was pretty fun. Yeah, it was cool. We just analyzed data, right, with, with our Python code. And just, we, we gave it these files of data. And, um, and we analyzed that data. Let's see here. Go. I better not make this full screen or else I'll like forget what time it is. And Lecture till 10.30. Nobody wants that, do they? <laughs> you, you guys feel free to let me know if I'm like, because I'm not, I'm not good with time. I'm one of those people who doesn't understand what time is. Uh, it's truly a miracle that I'm able to make it to school on time. If it wasn't for phone alarms, I don't know if it would happen. But yeah. If I ever go over, let me know. I try not to. Okay. Now we're at 4.3. How many sections are left here? Let's see. Uh, we did 4.3, I believe. Let's see here. Transformations. And then 4.4. What else is there after that? Uh, yeah. After 4.4. What is this? Trajectory equation models. So this is modeling with technology. I don't believe we'll be doing this. Yeah, so that's, this is the last chapter of this section, okay? So we will be having our exam over chapters three and four, okay? When will we be having that exam? Well, we have to cover this material today. And then I need to give you a week to do it, right? So that means you need till next Thursday to be able to complete this homework and to study for the exam. So that means let's have our test not next Thursday, but the following Tuesday. So let me give you a concrete day for that. Today is the 10-1, the October 1st. Okay, I'm going to give you a week to do all your homework and whatnot, and then on Tuesday, the, ten, the 13th. So, 10, 13th, we'll have our test. It'll be chapters two and three. I mean, uh, three and four. Does seem reasonable? It gives you time to think about the homework and study. If you have homework that you haven't turned in yet that you'd like to turn in, feel free to do so. Those deadlines are there to keep you, um, you know, in some type of like rigorous chronological framework. Uh, you know, we do have some grace about that as teachers. So. Don't feel like, oh, well, I didn't get my homework done. I'm just going to not try it. I'm just not going to learn that section. Don't have that mentality. Have the mentality of, 
well, maybe I didn't get it done, but I'm gonna I'm gonna try to to learn it and turn it in late, and uh, at least I learned that section. You know, that'll help me on the test and the quizzes so, and, and whatnot. Okay. So let's talk about something called simple harmonic motion. Or as physicists like to call it, show. Okay. Things things go in simple harmonic motion all the time. Um, a uh, a uh, what do you call this bird? Hummingbird. Hummingbird's wings. It's in simple harmonic motion. Me when I go like this. I'm in simple harmonic motion. A wave in the ocean or in a lake, it's in simple harmonic motion. Something in simple harmonic motion is just oscillating from side to side or up and down with some type of amplitude and some type of frequency, right? And some type of period. So it's very clear that this can correlate to sine and cosine, all right? Uh, our simple harmonic motion y of x can be modeled by a sine of bx or a cosine of bx. Either one, depending on which one fits the model the best. But as you know, if I, we can just kind of add a phase shift and turn cosine into sine. You know, notice that like this phase shift, like cosine of um, theta plus pi over two, right? That would equal sine of theta, wouldn't it? Because look, for instance, for zero, this is cosine of zero for theta becomes cosine of pi over two. That's sine of zero. So this means cosine of pi over two, which is equal to zero, is equal to sine of zero. So a horizontal shift can make cosine into sine, right? Yeah. So either one of these can work. You, you can actually just only use sines or you can only use cosine, it doesn't matter. They would both work. Okay. So let's define, we know, we know that A is the amplitude. We know that the period is 2 pi over B, right? And now we're going to define a new quantity. We're going to define the frequency. And this is going to be defined as 1 over the period. So in this case, it becomes b over 2 pi. That's frequency. OK. So let's say we're given a graph. Goes from, okay. This is negative three, positive three. And this is T axis. And that's 0 0.5 and 1.5. So 
I say 1.5, yeah. Okay, and then, then it ends up touching it at 2.5. Okay. Let's create a simple harmonic model for this graph. Clearly the amplitude is what? Yes. You know that because you say, okay, the, dis the, the distance from here to here divided by two is three. Now, when there's no vertical shift like here, it's very obvious what the amplitude is. But remember, if I pick the graph up and put it up like really high and you don't have the x-axis as, as a reference, it's not as simple. So you're gonna have to like do this measurement from highest to lowest and um, divide that value by two. Okay, so we know that the amplitude, the absolute value of it at least is equal to three. So this is going to equal to some y of t. Um, notice that it assumes a negative value at the beginning. And it assumes the most negative value that it can be at the beginning. So clearly, this is going to be a negative 3 as an amplitude, right? And which trigonometric function assumes its highest value at angle zero. Is it sine? Sine assumes that an output zero, right? Cosine does. Yeah, cosine of zero is actually uh, one. And so when you multiply it by a negative three, negative three times one outputs a negative three. So let's utilize the cosine function. And now all that we must determine is what is the period. If we know what the period is, question mark, we know that that's equal to 2 pi over v. So then we'll be able to solve for v. So what is this period? It's the time that it takes for it to go up and down and then back on the up right? It needs to complete one full cycle. So from here, it's going up and down, and then it's back on its way up, right? So why don't we measure from here to here? Because the period is the length in the x or the t that is required for it to travel um, one cycle. And it doesn't indicate it on my graph very well, but this is around 2.0. Okay. So, aha, we discovered the period. It's 2 or 2.0. All right. So let us algebraically solve for B. I, uh, can multiply both sides by b and then divide both sides by 2. So I get 2 pi over 2 is equal to b. And this reduces to pi. Aha. So this is going to be pi over here. And it's a variable in t, so we'll put a t right here. We've done it. we have created an equation for this given graph as a simple harmonic oscillator. So now, what is the frequency? Recall that the frequency is defined as one over the period. And we've discovered numerically the period is equal to 2. So this is 1 over 2. You guys hear that? That's my stomach. I'm, it's growling. 
it's a frequency. Do not be afraid. There's there's not like you know bobcats outside. <laughs> My stomach growling. <laughs> So we found the frequency. Okay. What else could we do here? Find the equation. We did it. Determine the frequency. Use the equation to find the position at t equals 1.8. Okay. Notice that over here, this is, this right here is t equals 1.5. So, let me move that right. At this position is t equals 1.5. So like around here maybe is 1.8. We aspire to know what is the function's value here, right here. It should be some negative number, right? What is the function, what is the function value right here? It should be some negative number, something a little bit less than or something a little bit greater than negative three right so if the question asks you if this simple harmonic oscillator is representing the motion of some of some mass on a spring for instance where where is the position of the mass on the spring at time equals 1.8 seconds do you guys have any suggestions on how we can find such a value? All you got to do is evaluate the function and replace t at 1.8. At 1.8, the function will output this value right here. It's going to be some negative number. Okay, we'll see. So this should equal negative three cosine of pi times 1.8. I don't know how to do that in my head. So let's just ask calculator. You guys got a calculator up? It's okay if you don't. I got one. Negative three cosine of one point eight times pi. Okay. And I need to be in radian mode, not degree mode, okay? Because we're inputting a pi radians. So this becomes a negative two point four three. approximately. So our conjecture about it being some number slightly greater than negative three was correct. Even visually on the graph, that is what our intuition was saying. But now numerically when we evaluate the function, we notice that that is true. So be prepared, be prepared to uh, be asked a question like this, like you'll be given a graph, you have to come up with the equation for the graph. And then I'll ask you, you know, right now this graph is showing us what's going on. And you could have probably even eyeballed this output, even though I, I want you to do this, not eyeball it. But notice the power of such a, such a parameterization. Notice that now I can ask you, what, where is the mass on the spring at time equals 100? So t, t is in like, it can be, in, in this case, it's in seconds, okay? But it can be in other units like years or hours, okay? This is in units centimeters, for instance. This is in units seconds. And you'd be able to calculate this. You'd easily be able to calculate it. 
you just say, okay, I know my parameterization is this. Why don't I just put 100 in there? I replace T with 100. This will tell us where is the function at. It sh surely it will it will be some number in between negative three and positive three, right? Because that the function is just going to oscillate, oscillate, oscillate. Oh, interestingly enough, would you look at that? It equals negative three. Does anybody care to explain why it's becoming negative three? One answer is because it just does. Because it just does. You plug it into the calculator and, and it just does. But another, another explanation is that if we take a look at 100, it's really 2 times 50, right? <clears throat> if you combine that 2 pi, if you combine this 2 and this pi, and then multiply times 50, times 50 afterwards, you'll realize that this is cosine of some multiple of 2 pi. So it's going to spin around 50 times, right? But then it's going to land back in the same spot as 2 pi is. And the cosine of 2 pi is 1. And when you multiply 1 times a negative 3, you get a negative 3. For the, for the people watching at home, feel free to ask questions in the chat. Let me know if you are hearing it and seeing it, or if you have any questions. Okay. Okay, so let's do a, oh man, this is a lot of chart here. So heck. Okay, so I'll just create one here. Let's create a situation here. An electron. Call that T negative. Is in an oscillating magnetic field. And undergoing. Simple harmonic motion. Given by y of x is equal to negative pi sine. of three x minus five plus two. Uh, well, actually, let's avoid adding this vertical shift and this horizontal shift, okay? Because that's too many concepts at once. Let's just keep it simple for now. Let's say it's just 2 cosine of pi x. Let's just keep it at that for now. All right. 
Here's some things we want to know. What is the frequency equal to? What is the period equal to? What is the amplitude equal to? What is the graph look like? And where is the electron at time is equal to 1,000 seconds? And I will say that y of x is given in uh, micrometers. That symbol is called the symbol mu. It's for micrometers. One micrometer is equal to 10 to the negative 6 meters. Meaning 10 to the 6 micrometers fit in one meter. Meaning you need a million micrometers to make one meter. A meter is like this long. So you need a million micrometers. So that means we chop up an interval of this, this length, so this long. We chop it up into a million pieces. Just like a millimeter. Chops up a meter into a, a thousand pieces and a centimeter chops up a meter to a hundred pieces. So let us begin. Where should we start here? I always like to start with the amplitude. It's the absolute value of two. So it's equal to two. Then what can we do? Well, if we know period is 2 pi over b, and we know b is pi, why don't we just calculate period? It's 2 pi over b, but our b is a pi. Well, our period is 2. Can I move the screen a little bit more this way or this way? Good. Is that better? Nice. Right. So then now, what does the graph look like? label the graph here. This is in micrometers. Has an amplitude of two, period of two. And so I want to know what is it doing at zero? Well, I replace x with zero. Zero times pi is zero. So this is cosine of zero. Cosine of zero is one. One times two is two. One, two, put a dot. Next, I want to see, let's say, what is this thing doing at one? When x is one, this becomes pi times one, which is pi. Cosine of pi is negative one. Negative one times two is a negative two. So at one, this thing creeps down to negative two. So what is it doing at two? This was one. This was two. Well, when x is two, this becomes 
2 pi, cosine of 2 pi is 1, 1 times 2 is 2. So it goes back up here. Aha, that's why it says that the period, that's why our mathematics is showing that the period is 2, because when we move over 2, the dot appears at the same height again. And so, So we'll get forever. We'll just move on like that. So now we have discovered the graph. So actually, let's do one more piece. When is it crossing this, this axis here? It's when what's inside here evaluates to zero, right? So for what value is cosine zero? Well, cosine is zero at pi over two and three pi over two, right? So the way you can figure out where is this crossing the x-axis here? Where, where is it crossing the x-axis over here? We may answer this question by saying, okay, let's set this equal to like what pi over two. Pi x equal to pi over 2, because cosine of pi over 2 is 0, right? And I want to know when is the output of this function 0. So I can cancel out pi's, right? So that means x is a half. So, oh, that's why this thing seems to be crossing the x-axis in between, halfway between 1 and 0, right? You can also do this trick and say, okay, that pi x, let it equal 3 pi over 2. It's a lot of pi's, and x is equal to 3 over 2, which is 1.5. Oh, that's why it seems to be going through halfway between 2 and 1. Right? Okay. Now, where, how, how many units away is the electron at t equals 1,000 seconds? That was our last question. Who here knows what an electron is? What is an electron? Describe it to us. Part of an atom and it's a negative charge. Part of an atom and it's a negative charge, right? So you got, oh, so you got, here's the atom. You're saying here's the electron right here. And it spins around the atom, right? <laughs> that was what we thought of electrons were. Um, uh, nearly, yeah, yeah, over 100 years ago. Over a hundred years ago, that is what we thought electrons really look like. Now it's not so much an accurate viewpoint. And let me tell you a little bit of stuff about who, who here has heard about quantum mechanics? Kind of heard about quantum mechanics? Okay, here's a cool thing about quantum mechanics. It's a branch of science in theoretical physics and um, it studies how do things move that are really, 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 really hard to imagine small, like an electron. So let's say I got this little thing right here. I got, I got this flying rock. And let's say I put it in a box. Put it in a box. I go home. Tomorrow, when I come back, could I expect to find this rock in that box again, if nobody touches it. Yes. You can expect to find it there for sure. But if we do that with an electron, if we put an electron in a box, we don't even have to go home and come back. In a matter of instance, we could check and that electron is no longer inside that box. 
it disappeared. And we have no idea why it's doing that. We have no idea why electrons behave like that. All very tiny fundamental particles behave like that. Their position is uncertain. We can't tell really, we can't for sure precisely tell that they're right here or are they right here or are they right here. It could be the same electron. You put it in a box, it might be in the box in one second and another second, it might not be in the box anymore. Then a few moments after that, it might reappear in the box, but it might be in a different region where you put it. So what we ended up learning as human beings is that electrons really aren't like little dots that move around the atom, really. They form this cloud of probability around them. Where the electron is maybe 30% of the time in this cloud, 20% of the time in this cloud, and maybe 50% of the time in this cloud. It becomes a chance, like look at the draw, like Flipping a coin. Just thought I'd introduce you to a little bit of quantum mechanics because I said, where is the position of the electron? What I'm trying to say is, finding the position of the electron would be very difficult in real life. And that this model is not necessarily accurate but it works towards creating an example for this class. We need to evaluate y of a thousand, right? To give us in micrometers, where is this electron? We do have tools that allow us to actually try and determine where an electron might be and we can, through a high probability, predict its location. But the equations aren't as simple as this, these right here. They're more complicated. But if you understand trigonometry, you take some calculus, you take some differential equations and some linear algebra, you can understand it. It's not that bad at all. So we notice that a thousand is really two times 500, right? So again, what's here is a multiple of two pi, meaning we rotate around the circle 500 times, but we still end up where two pi was. So this is the same thing as cosine of two pi, which gives me what? Boom. So this electron, is two micrometers away. Don't forget your units on, on the exam. I will give you things with units and you need to know that, okay, this output is in micrometers and this input is in seconds. Remember that. Now let's use sine cosine to model population. Population growth and population decay. Who here likes hunting? Like hunting? Yeah, so during hunting season, the population of deer is gonna go down, right? Because we're out there trying to catch some yummy deer. But then when we let them breed, the population goes back up, right? So actually the deer population is behaving like a sine wave or a cosine wave, right?
I can't wait to go hunting. When is deer hunting season in Oklahoma? Are you guys not from Oklahoma? Where are you guys from? Texas. You're from Texas? When is deer hunting season in Texas? Uh, I think mule deer is <clears throat> like the summer, like tail is a little earlier. Okay. So I might go down to Texas during Christmas break. <laughs> I bet there's some good, you know, everything's bigger in Texas. I bet the deers are huge there. <laughs> December, okay, I'll keep that in mind. I don't, you know, I, I like to just catch the deer with my hands. <laughs> I don't like to harm it. I'm just like, no, I'm just kidding. This is what I'll use for hunting. Whoop, hopefully it hits it and it works. I'm just trying to make you guys laugh. So let's say uh, we're modeling a population and our population function, P of T, given by this. Pi over 5T plus 9,000. Okay, here's your population with respect to time. Yeah, let's say it's, it's the population of deer in Texas with respect to time in years. So T is in years. One thing you need if you want to go hunting and you actually are successful, you need a deep freeze, don't you? Because all that meat Probably one deer. How much how much dollars worth of meat can you get off of one deer? Depends on the deer, right? No, I don't, we don't sell it. You don't sell it? Uh, we would give some to friends. Or friends. That's cool. No, I bet, you know, the equivalent amount of meat for like a medium-sized deer is like probably like 800 bucks. Yeah. <laughs> That's a lot, you know. That's pretty good. So years, if you think about it like that, you're like, man, I should become a professional hunter. But there's restrictions on how, how many you can hunt per, per year. So, not so fast. <laughs> and then, uh, okay, so T is in years. P of T is in numbers of deer. All right, find the period. What is the period equal to? How can we find the period, guys? The period? Yeah, that's amplitude. Well, since you said that, number two. Let's find amplitude. It's A. Absolute value of 1,200, so it's 1,200. To honor Travis's request, we found amplitude first. But now, let's not dilly dally, let's find the period. How we find that? Yes, absolutely right. 2 pi over B. I know your last name is Mora. I forgot your first name. First name was Josh. Joshua Moore. Man, come on, man. Joshua Moore. And that's Harrison Pettigrew. And we got Anthony Imnon. And I don't know where Kinsey Cortez and Pamela Jimenez are. I don't know where those students are. This is a crazy world we're living in right now, so. <laughs> I don't blame people. <laughs> Sometimes they go missing and it's, it's understandable. 2 pi over B. Okay, we got a 2 pi over here. 
uh, we got 5 over 5 over here. So when we multiply by reciprocals, we get 2 pi divided by 1. Multiplying by reciprocals over here, cancel out the pi. This becomes a 10. Our period is equal to 10. What does this mean, guys? What does the period of this function being 10 imply about the deer population? Let's interpret this result. What does it imply about the deer population? What happens every 10 years in the deer population? Given any population of deer at any time, this model is saying that if you fast forward 10 years, the population of deer should be the exact same. Or if you rewind 10 years, the population of deer should be exactly the same. So it, it says that the deer population ebbs and it flows. Sometimes it increases, sometimes it decreases. But every 10 years, it's, it's the same population. Because the period represents the amount of distance you must traverse along the x-axis for the function to complete a full cycle. And since our function models population, that is the result of that. So we have period, we have amplitude. Um, let's graph it. Okay. I'll put a 10 over here. All right. Let's think about what is this function initially. At t equals zero, this becomes cosine of zero, which is one times this becomes 1,200. Well, we've got to add 9,000 to it, right? So 1,200 plus 9,000 is 10,200, right? And then it's going to dip down um, when I drew that wrong. I, I drew it dipping down too much because that means how can the deer population recover from having no deer, right? <laughs> They have to be some deer so for them to reproduce. So so my apologies on that. Boom. All right. So what is this minimum value that the deer population will achieve over here? Well, it correlates to the minimum value that the cosine value can achieve. At what angle is cosine the smallest number it can be? And I'll give you a hint. The smallest number cosine can evaluate to is a negative one. That's right. It occurs when what's inside the parentheses, that pi over 5t, when that equals pi, because cosine of pi is negative 1, right? So I can cancel out these pi's here. So I get 1 over 5t is equal to 1. That means when I multiply both sides by 5, I get t is equal to 5. 
continues in years, right? So this occurs at five years right here. And over here in 10 years, it will reassume its maximum population value. Now that we've determined that, what is the minimum population value? Because we've realized that the maximum population value of deer is 10,200. That's what me and Travis are out there trying to catch them with their bare hands. You gotta lay, you gotta, this is how you do it, man. You put a bunch of brushes and leaves on, on your head and you just wait until one of them is just real, real close. And you jump out and you catch it. <laughs> They're probably way faster than those humans, so. That's probably not going to work. They can fight too. They can? Yeah, the, the bucks. Yeah. We would lose in a fight against a buck for sure because what do they weigh? Like a thousand pounds? Some of them? Maybe not that much, but they're heavy. <laughs> and they have sharp antlers. The females fight each other with their hooves. Wow. Like they stand up on their hind legs. And they fight over the. the, the like if you got corn on or something. Oh, okay. They fight over it. They'll fight over the corn. <laughs> That's cool. So do you leave food traps for them to come eat the food? Well, we just like, we have land, so sometimes we'll just spread some out there just for them to come around. Okay. That's cool. That's cool. Hmm. Note to self. Texan deer like corn. I'll remember that one. <laughs> okay. So. Um, what is going to be this minimum value right here? I want to know what is the smallest population the deer will achieve? How can I determine that, guys? What I'm saying is I want to measure how high is this right here. Could you do it by proportion? Like, like every five years is like blank amount, and then like every ten years is ten thousand two hundred, and then. That's a really oh. good idea. Yeah, that's a really good idea. Proportions work because of like similar triangles, right? So I got let's say I have a big triangle, and I I got like another triangle within the triangle. Proportions work because this and that is proportional to this and that. That's a really good idea, but you don't have to even go and do something that elaborate. Recall our function P of T tells us our population, right? So we know that the function is this, is this high off of the ground whenever I input a what into it? Time. Yeah, what time should I input? Five. Five. That'll tell me exactly what that minimum value is if I replace every t with a 5 in this function. So really, this was a really good idea. But you don't even need to do that. It's not even necessary. All you got to do is evaluate the function at 5. What is p of 5? And 5, so this 1,200 cosine of pi over five times five plus 9,000. So notice the fives cancel and you get cosine of pi, which is negative one. So this becomes negative 1,200 plus 9,000. So what is the result of that? Do you guys agree? Yeah. So the lowest population the deer will achieve is 7,800 of them. But if you wait five years, their population will go back up to 10,200.
How did you get that? Okay. Um, yeah, okay. All right, so how are we doing on time here? So this is not special to sine or cosine. We can use cosecant, we could use tangent, we can use cotangent, okay? All of those will work. So what, what I'm gonna do is, I'm gonna give you guys your quiz. And after that, I'll sign the homework out of this section. And then on Tuesday, what we'll do is we'll move on, okay? But maybe the class period before the exam, if you guys want, we could do some review, if, if you'd like. If you don't want the review, that's fine. We'll just move, up, move ahead. Well, that's just going to be a one question quiz. Graph. Um, y of x is equal to negative 3 sine of Two, no, not two. Yeah, two. Uh, let's say uh, three x minus a pi plus a one. So it's got a horizontal shift. It's got a vertical shift. It has a non-standard frequency or non-standard period. So I'll plot this on a X and a Y axis for me. And I'll give you a hint. It helps to create a Y of X, X table, right? Pick various values for the inputs and then find those values and put a dot and put a dot and put a dot and put a dot and then connect the dots. That is your best bet in solving these problems. Those of you at home, feel free to email me a picture of your solution. <laughs> 